it's Christy Day here at Wool Envy. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a little background on these wool felted boots with the Vibram sole. So people are interested in making wool boots and I'm interested in teaching people how to make wool boots and uh, facilitating that dream for your life if you'd like to do that. Um, shoe making is incredibly fun. You're going to need a couple things. You're going to need a textured um, rolling pin. You're going to need a traditional felting tool called a ruble so that you can maximize the pressure on your rolling when you're fulling your felt. You're going to need something to spray your water. My favorite is this multi-purpose pump. I buy them new so that there's never any chemicals in them. Then you can evenly spray your wool. If you want to save yourself some money and go a little less tech, you can simply fill water in a mason jar, poke some holes in the lid, and sprinkle your wool like that. You're also going to need some soap. Any soap will do. I have this custom made by a local soap artisan. It is a high quality, um, no scent, olive oil soap. Felters love olive oil because it moisturizes our hands when we felt. You're also going to need a synthetic net. Any synthetic netting will do. Um, and the reason it needs to be synthetic is you don't want it to stick to your wool while you're felting. You're also going to need a towel. Um, you're going to be wrapping your felt in a towel. I always put down a non-skid mat below it so I get a lot of traction when I'm rolling. These I just pick up at Walmart. They're just sold for putting under rugs. They're also sold for putting in um, shelf linings. So they could be shelf liners or they could be um, rug stabilizers. You're also going to need a template material. I love bubble wrap because I can feel it when I'm felting. And truth be told, I love giant <laughs> bubble wrap because I can feel that even better. But um, sometimes I use small, sometimes I use big. I love bubble wrap though. Now a lot of felters use um, floor underlayment that you'll get in, in the um, hardware store. And it's that sort of foamy stuff that you see in packaging. Mm -hmm. You can use that. I just don't because it's hard for me to feel. But the purpose is so that both, when you're making your template, your wool does not stick together. You have to have a resist in there to prevent that from happening. Once I get this, all, oh, well, of course you're going to need the wool. Hold on. <laughs> Let me show you the wool I use. This is the type of wool I use. It is not roving. It is batting. And it comes in a big you know, sheet that can literally be rolled out. This felt just like 20 times better than individual roving. And when you do this, um, I'll show you how you, you tear it apart to put it in. You don't individually fluff out and like that would literally, that would take forever, probably take about an hour to do each layer if you were going to do it that way. Now if you're a traditional felter, and you know all about the proper technique for laying your wool, you can do it that way. Um, it will work, it will just take a long time. So if you want to use roving, that's all you have, you, more power to you. This is just quicker. Um, then when you get, oh yeah, after you've made your template and you've felted your piece, it'll, these are actually connected together. This one's been cut out of a boot. So they'll be, uh, if you want to film this, it'll actually have a, a mate on the other side. So it'll be one long thing. And there's a mathematical formula that I use to, to make these that calculates the end step, the length, and factors in how wool actually shrinks um, because it doesn't uniformly shrink when you're rolling it. So um, when I make kits available, I will provide these for you. But um, because it is an actual a lot of math, um, and the formula looks a little bit like this. 
Okay, so there's a lot of calculating for shrinkage in different locations. It's not a uniform shrinkage. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to shrink at 30% because it doesn't shrink 30% around the whole boot. It shrinks in different spots. So um, the other thing you're going to need at the end stage is you're going to need a foot last. Now, some people use wooden foot lasts, some people use plastic foot lasts. I actually make my own foot lasts. And I start by taking a cutout of my customer's foot or their exact measurements that they send me. And I go over to my set of antique cobbler shoes and I match them up so I get the right size. But see, this is... <laughs> This is an antique for a boot, so it's far thinner than it, than it needs to be right here. It's really for like a cowboy boot. So what I do is I use a hardening foam to increase, and then I attach that to here and just, and just tape it all up so it's really, really hard. But I'm in the process of actually making a very hard foam um, last that I'll have available for sale in my kits so that you won't have to make your own lasts and you won't have to pay literally 30 to 92 dollars for a last it's crazy so I mean if you want to make a pair of, of you know shoes for a loved one I don't think you should have to pay 92 bucks to, to just get one element of your kit so there's that then you're gonna need uh, a sole. Now you want a cup sole and I will be stocking some soles, uh, a variety. These soles are excellent soles. They're Vibram soles. And the only thing is that Vibram only makes soles size 8 to size 14 men's. So that cuts out a lot of women. So I'm sourcing some soles. I'm actually having um, some CAD drawings made up right now and I'm looking at 3D printing soles so that we'll have children's soles, short people's soles, wide foot soles, you name it, we can print a sole for you. It's just going to take some time um, to get the process rolling. Now the other thing that you're going to need is barge cement. That's a little bit pricey when it comes in a big can. I think you can buy it in a smaller can. If you were going to make one pair of shoes you would need a bottle like about this big. So I think you'd probably need about maybe two ounces of, of um, glue. But this is a weather curing glue. So as the weather changes, it just becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So I'll teach you how to properly use it because it's not super intuitive. <laughs> you wouldn't know that. But um, I had to actually do a little education on how to properly uh, let it cure up and bond. It will not work on PVC or vinyl products at all. So the right glue for the right uh, surfaces you can do, but don't go you know crazy trying to figure out some cheaper glue because it will not work. Um, the other thing I use, um, if you're going to do a lace up, oh, forgot, you're going to have to prep your soles. You you can't just glue a sole. You're going to have to sand your sole to rough it up, and you're going to have to remove it, all oils from the sole. Um, and there's a factory coating on the sole, so all of that has to be removed before you even begin to, to attach it. So you're going to need acetate um, to remove all oils from your sole before you try to glue it. Now the reason I use cup soles is because it gives you a nice area to sew your sole on after you glue it. This way you're going to have a really, really, really secure um, sole that's going to definitely stay. So, sewing on soles is a little bit of an art. And you have to learn it from a cobbler generally, and they don't particularly like to share their craft in general. However, I did have somebody teach me how to do it. And, unbeknownst to me, you do not use a uh, needle and thread. You use a cobbler's awl. And you can purchase these little cobbler awls on Amazon, which is where I got mine. And when you purchase them, 
they come with a whole set of needles. So they're also called lock stitch awls. So I got this. This is a Colink brand in brass. They have wooden ones, but what they do is you loosen this up and you can take out your, it almost looks like a crochet hook, or you can put it, it has a needle opening. Now here's the key. This little opening must be larger than your thread, or else you will cut your thread when you're sewing your, your sole on. So this is what I use. It's, a, it's like a 1.6 millimeter hook, and then I have one millimeter thread that is made for shoes. So it's actually um, cobbler's um, waxed thread. So the entire spool of thread is waxed. So it's a strong heavy duty nylon with a wax coating. And this is what cobblers use for all soles. And you can buy these, you know, in all different colors. I got those on Amazon too. Now this piece of equipment, oh I forgot about this. You're also going to need a set of, of uh, really heavy duty clamps. Now you can maybe try to just stand in your boots if they're for you and weight them. And what I do is I put these metal weights into the soles and I clamp them. Um, but you know you can try it without it, but I always clamp them. Because if you clamp them, the wool will, I mean, the glue will set up faster um, in a minutes, really. There's some preparation but <laughs> for, of the glue, but once it's all fully cured and ready to be fixed, you clamp it for 10 minutes, and it is on there. I got these Denali ones on Amazon, too. And then I've got, like, you know, 10 of them. I think it's a set of 10 or 12. They're all different sizes, which I like because... Um, you know, different parts of the shoe are thicker when you're clamping it, so you you can't really use these unless you're doing baby shoes. <laughs> if you're doing baby shoes, you can do it, but you need clamps. Okay, you also need a scale. Now, a scale I use to make sure that each layer of my wool is actually the same weight so that I'm evenly distributing the wool. I'm going to put several layers of that wool um, onto the shoe, um, three layers for each side. So you want to make sure that it's even and you don't have any holes. So the scale helps with that. Once you finally get your shoe all felted and formed and ready and you want to put in a tongue, you're going to want to put grommets in it or you're going to want to put those boot hooks in it. To do either one, you're going to need an industrial grommet setter. Now you might say to yourself, wait a second, I don't want to spend a hundred bucks for a professional grommet setter. You could take yours to a cobbler instead and ask, you know, pay the cobbler to do it for you. Um, so you could hire a cobbler to do that for you. Um, you know, they might charge you about thirty or forty dollars to do it. Um, but, you know, talk to your cobbler and see if they'd be willing to do that for you. Um, now, you say to yourself, hey Christy, can't I just put in uh, grommets, self-piercing grommets myself with a hammer and a little thing? You could, however, I caution you, because once you've gotten to this stage, you've spent about 25 hours making your shoe. And it would be a shame to hammer it and have your and have it look like this and not stick on or stick on and be crooked. <laughs> I mean it would just kind of destroy your whole look after all that work. So if you're gonna do, even if you're using this, do some practice ones with your with different pieces of felt, okay? It took me a while to practice to get it right so um, definitely practice. Now, uh, let me show you one cautionary project. When I very, the first time I did put grommets, it was not for shoes, it was for um, a Nuno felted dress that was in an art show. And it had to be adjustable in sizes, so I was just going to have it lace up the back. And let me show you, none of these grommets, 
There's only like two grommets that are still in here. And these are grommets that I did. See how they just plop right out? These are grommets that I did with a hammer. So seriously, I, I cannot stress enough the importance of using the proper grommet and inserting them with a professional industrial cobbler's grommet press. Okay? And that's it on that. After you get all these done, you think, my shoes are done! No, they're not. <laughs> now you need to, well actually, you're going to have to felt it a one more time to, to customize it into the sole. Okay, because when you first put it in, it's kind of puffing out above your sole. So you felt it again, you form it, you shape it, you get it all right, you dry it. It takes about a day or two to dry it. And then you steam it. And when you steam it, it gives it a really nice, smooth finish because it's incredibly fuzzy. If you, if you don't do that. And also, if you're using a different wool that's maybe not as high, low micron, that's maybe a finer one, which I don't really suggest because it pills later on after you wear it for a little while. But if you did, um, you would maybe get some waves and some bubbling in your, in your felt. And the way to get rid of that is to steam it. So after you do all of that, in about 30 hours, you will have yourself a pair of boots. The end.